been the support for our spouses in ministry at the School of Religion, so thank you for uh, helping her. That's September, right, Mary? Yeah, September. It's September 22. 22. Great. Okay, great. I need about well, four. We need about four churches yeah. there. Okay. <laughs> I heard uh, in our area we have 30 churches in a 10 mile radius, so <laughs> we can find four. Um, welcome everyone, it's so good to be with you. Uh, welcome to the Sabbath School here, I pray that your summer's been going well. We just came back from a trip to France and Switzerland celebrating the 150 years of Adventist mission. I don't know if you know this, maybe you've seen it, it's been 150 years that Jay and Andrews left the United States and went to Switzerland to be the first official missionary of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's, and um, quite a story, you know that he lost his wife just before he left, and then while they were serving there, his dear daughter Mary learned French, she would uh, communicate with the locals, she died as a teenager from tuberculosis. And then uh, he said, I'm willing to give my life to this mission. Well, ultimately, that's what happened. Uh, Jay and Andrews also lost his life to, to tuberculosis as well a few years later. So just an extraordinary way that he sacrificed for mission. But there are a number of churches and schools there now because of his sacrifice. And it was wonderful to go and celebrate the mission of the Adventist Church there as well. With that... As we begin, we are going to have a word of prayer. We'll be looking at John chapter 9 this morning. We'll see if we'll get to 10. I'm not sure, but uh, we will invite the Lord to be with us in prayer. Let us pray together. Father God, we thank you that you are the light of the world. We also thank you that sometimes we feel that we may be forgotten just like the blind man in John chapter 9, but we thank you that you see us. We thank you that, Lord, you recognize us when people may just look at us, you actually see us. We thank you for your grace. We pray that you fill us with your Holy Spirit now, and may we walk away transformed, just as this man did in John chapter 9. May we experience sight that can only come through your Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, to, as, as I mentioned, we'll be looking at the healing of the man born blind in chapter 9. And just as an icebreaker question here, maybe you've answered these before. If you had to lose one of your senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, or smell, which one would you choose to lose and why? If you had to lose one. Smell. Smell. People would choose to lose smell, okay? Smell any reason why that would be? Okay, you'd, you'd eat less that way, someone says, if you could for our diets. Less debilitating. Less debilitating, okay. Would anyone say they want to lose their sight? No. No, right? And in fact, most people say that's not the case. In fact, a study was done, uh, conducted by one poll. They asked 2,000 Americans what is the most important sense to them? And 77% said it was their vision that was the most important sense. And so that's that three out of four people, even more, said that vision is the most important thing to them. The last one they said was taste. You know, uh, I'm not saying this because my wife is here, but she cooks amazingly, so it wouldn't be taste. For some people, maybe they prefer to lose their taste, depending on the kinds of meals they have. I don't know. But uh, one percent I found that interesting was uh, the sense of taste was last there. But most people want to keep their vision. Uh, it would be difficult to lose our vision. And yet we have the story of the blind man here. In researching this, I found this story of Dr. Pawan Sinha. He has a project called Project Prakash, which means light, Project Light. And he's a professor from MIT, originally from New Delhi. And he started an amazing program, Project Light. And in this program, he's helped over right now 440 children born with cataracts and has helped them gain their sight. His research has been groundbreaking, teaching us a lot about how we see, how we learn. 
Interestingly enough, however, it's adults who gain their sight. He learned something interesting from the research. When adults gain their sight after being born blind, they often struggled with adjustment. You wonder, well, what kind of adjustment do they need to work with after they've gained their sight? Well, they, be they become overwhelmed with information and they see everything but can't make sense of it all. So, for instance, they'll see a shadow of a tree and they think that the shadow will cause them to trip. And so they'll be afraid of the shadows. Okay? They're just learning how to deal with the visual stimulus that they now have. So objects can become a bit frightening to them. Uh, things that are not solid that they begin to think are solid as their mind is wrapping around the visual stimulation they're receiving. What I find interesting about that is that the healing of the blind man was a complete healing. It was complete in every single way as he was healed by Jesus. So, we're going to just be giving a, a brief overview of John. Um, this may have been shared last week by, by Myron, I believe. And John has the most I am statements, and you can see them all there. I am. And it goes through all the way to John chapter 15. We're going to be looking at the I am statement in John chapter 8, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And here he'll be curing blindness. Now, some of you may wonder, how was, what was the cause of blindness back then? Any thoughts? We know that there were a number of uh, miracles connected to Jesus healing those that were blind. It's not something that is maybe as common today, people born with blindness. I know that that is the case, but it was more common back in Bible antiquity time. Well, some of the reasons that were given is um, eye disease had fewer few cures back then. They believe it was because of insanitary water that was there. It was very unsanitary. And so maybe the water and the purity of the water was a cause of the blindness. But whatever it is, blindness was a large problem in antiquity. And Jesus was the one that healed blindness. We also see in the book of John that there are seven miracles. Okay, in the book of John, we are dealing with the sixth miracle, the man born blind. And the last miracle in the book of John, and I can't wait to get to that portion either, either is the resurrection of Lazarus. Now, if we think, however, that the miracle of the blind man is simply God showing off his power and saying, look what I can do. I can heal those that are blind, that it's only related to physical healing, we would have missed the point. Okay, of this miracle. This miracle is much more significant. In fact, John is specifically and in much detail picking specific miracles to illustrate points. You know, at the end of John, he says, there's so much more that Jesus did that I could have shared with you. However, I'm just choosing the miracles that highlight a spiritual point about Jesus. So he chooses miracles that are significant and have spiritual meaning behind them. And therefore, the miracle of the healing of the blind man represents not only God's power to transform lives, but also God's power to bring spiritual healing. Just a bit, some outlines here. Um, this was, this as I was doing some, some reading, uh, the seven W's of John 9. I just really love this. This is a good way to maybe think about and memorize the outline of John chapter 9. We start with the wondering. Okay, the disciples questioning, why was this man born blind? There's, there's a lot of questions being asked. Then there's the working. Jesus emphasizes the works of God that must be done while it is day because nighttime is coming. Then there is the washing, the blind man being instructed by Jesus to wash in the pool of Siloam. Then there's the walking, the blind man walking to the pool of Siloam to wash. Then there's the witnessing, right? The neighbors and others witnessing the man's healing and questioning him about it. Then there's the wondering again, this continuous questioning coming now from the Pharisees. 
and discussions about the man's healing. And then finally it ends with what? With the worshipping. With the worshipping. The ultimate result of the man's healing leading to worship and acknowledgement of Jesus, uh, Jesus as the Son of God there. So we're going to start with John chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. So if you have your Bibles there, you can turn there as well. John chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And as we read these verses, I'm going to uh, shift over to a question to you, so be ready, because we want to see how does the response of Jesus firstly differ from the response of the disciples? So John chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Would someone like to read that? Is it too early if you'd like to start us off here? Okay, Jeremy will read it. Thank you so much. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What's going on here? Anyone have any thoughts with the contrasting Jesus with the disciples, or even the question about what the disciples raised? Uh, one thing I wonder about is, uh, obviously being involved in the training of ministers here, I, I find myself wondering, what is it that prompts us? You see a situation of great need, mm. and is that your first question? I mean, is it, you do not have some compassion for the individual, and I, I guess one of the things that I think, Joseph, is that there seems to be a detached nature that it becomes an occasion for a theological discussion. And obviously I'm happy for Jesus to set their thinking right on this, but I find myself thinking, what is my reaction when I see a situation of, of human need? It's a, a, a pitiful situation. I mean, this is a person that is blind from birth, has never seen anything that, that brings us delight and wonderment and joy in life. And their question is, who sinned, this man or his parents? Right, so, so they want to go into a theological debate right now, right? There's, there's a hand up here. Thank you, Jim. Well, that was an expectation. You know, somebody messed up somewhere along the line. This is punishment for what they did, or his parents, or them, or whoever. So that was a teaching back at that time. Yeah, so, so question here, okay? This man was born blind. Who sinned, him or his parents? How can, how can a man born blind, a child, how could he have sinned? Did he, did he kick his mother too hard in the womb? Is that what's going on? What, 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 what kind of understanding do they have about this man's ability to sin, even from uh, the point of birth? <clears throat> I can't necessarily answer that question, but I have often wondered the implication of that statement is that that they have perfection in their own lives because surely if they were aware of their own sinful state, then they would be afflicted with something as well. So do they only count certain things as being sinful, certain large sins, so to speak? I've just always wondered that. Right. Yeah. Over here. One thing I might point out that at least if, if one positive thing could be said about their question, it would be that they do have the sense that this is not the way things are meant to be. In other words, the world is not meant to be that way with right. children born with blindness or, or deafness or whatever it might be. Well, one thing that I, I like about this is that there is such a closeness with the disciples that they felt comfortable to maybe ask a question that maybe sounded unkind. And I like that. There was, they're, they're kind of hobnobbing with Jesus, shoulder to shoulder talking. And there's an implication here that everybody kind of knew this guy. Because how would you know right off the bat, oh yeah, he was born blind. You know, it's kind of like you give directions to somebody and you know where, where blind Matthew lives in the corner, yeah, that guy, yeah go there and then you turn right. So they all kind of knew this. And sometimes we throw the disciples under the bus, but I, I like to have, like I live with somebody 
that I always feel very comfortable asking him questions, however crazy they might sound, because he knows my heart. And he knows that I'm, I'm really wondering about this. And I wouldn't say it out loud to everybody else, because they think, Mary, can you ask that? But I think it's, it's, it's compassionate. Jesus is, is letting, he's approachable. He's letting his disciples ask him these things, even though it sounds harsh. But I like a God that we can ask him anything. Yeah, we can ask God our questions over here at the front and at the back. I like that they had the courage to ask Jesus that too, but it breaks my heart to think that was the teaching coming from the uh -huh. from the leaders in the church, uh, that God is so cruel, it doesn't matter if his parents said he's going to put this on the child. That is horrific. And Jesus is not like that. And he showed them over and over. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is how he is. He loves you so much. He isn't looking to place a, a, a malady like that on somebody, especially an infant, my goodness. Yeah. Yes, there were consequences for sin. The, parent, the man at the pool of Bethesda had lived a terrible life. That was the result, his paralysis of his life. But how can they even think that? It's because it came down from the teachers, and that's pitiful. Right, right. And the sad thing is, most likely, he grew up as a child thinking that he was rejected exactly. by God. Exactly. That, that was what was repeated to him. Yeah. And yet we do this now. I worked at Children's Hospital, T.C. Thompson, and you would have a child born that had multiple disabilities. And the doctor would say to the mom, so have you been on drugs? Have you been on? So it would have been the mother's fault. So we kind of condemn the poor disciples. You know, who messed up? Mm -hmm. You know, was the mom taking drugs? Or they didn't say it like that. But we still say that now because we have to get to the bottom of why this child was born like this. Whose fault is it, right? <laughs> yeah. We were simultaneously just wondering here um, if this hadn't been passed on for just generations and generations coming out of the Old Testament of the sins of the father are passed on to the third and fourth generation. I'm, yeah, I'm wondering if there's some of that, though, that right. influenced their thinking. So we have that verse in Exodus, right? The, you know, the, the blessings flow and also the curses flow. If I'm, if I'm correct, and we've got uh, some major theologians here, the sins of the fathers can also refer to spiritual leaders as well, right? And we also know in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 19 to 23, the one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent. That's what Ezekiel says, right? Nor will the parents share the guilt of the child. And so this idea, it's even in the Old Testament that the child will not bear the sins of the parent, but your reference to, uh, you know, the spiritual fathers may be referring to church leaders and the impact that can have on, on following generations. Um, I think others have kind of brought this home in the last couple of people who spoke and but I still want to mention, even as a Seventh-day Adventist who was raised steeped in righteousness by faith, like it was my father's passion during a time when it was not so popular, heard it every day. When my mom got Alzheimer's, and I'm sorry, this is such a huge part of my life, um, this, this journey that I'm on. I asked over and over again for years, why, Lord, why she did everything right. I was truly angry with God because somewhere, maybe from the law of the harvest, which is something I've always believed in, what you sow, you will reap. Um, I expected my parents' elderly years to be blessed with just health and vigor and I was going to do that and that was going to happen in my life because I was going to do everything right and then I'd get everything right. It, it's, we have it. I mean, bring it home to the modern times. We still do it. Yeah. And it's such a good point you're raising because this child was born blind. What did he do wrong? Right. He was born that way. 
And, and so that condition of sometimes it's the circumstances we're born in, not necessarily what we've done. Yeah. And I think in connection with what Doreen was saying, it is, let's notice, Jesus didn't say that what a parent does never has an impact on what their child, what, what happens to their child. We, we know that that is the case of so fetal alcohol syndrome and things like that. I, I think the, the, the problem with the disciples' question is they wanted to pinpoint it with complete accuracy. What, what caused this person to be born blind? And, and maybe what Jesus is going to lead us to recognize is that we don't have to know in every case, and we can't know in every case, but what we can know is that every time there is someone that is experiencing the results of sin in the world, it becomes an occasion for God's glory to be revealed. And I think that's the point that he's trying to make, that, that even in the saddest of cases, sometimes there are situations where the child is suffering precisely for what the parent has done. But, but Jesus is still driving us to recognize this is an occasion for God's grace and glory to be revealed by how we interact with that situation. Over here, and as, as uh, we're moving there as well, I think that Jesus is not entering the theological debate with them. He's focusing on the suffering of the man. Okay, and sometimes we can go into uh, these these kind of rabbit trails. Jesus' focus is on the person, and I just think that's such an important lesson there. Something kind of simple to notice, but I, it, it touches me. Um, whenever Jesus passes by, uh, he never leaves that place the same. And the other thing is, it says he saw a man. And Jesus initiates. He's the initiator. And even when you can't see him, or you are suffering in your own blindness, whatever it is, take heart, he sees you. And it's, as we find out, and we're all alluding to this, there's more than just one blind man there. Yeah, yeah, and I love that. The man didn't see Jesus, but Jesus saw him. And the reality is we can fall into this trap even in the church, right? Um, when something happens, whose fault was it? Maybe it's the occasion to see the glory of God in those situations, right? Um, it's important to remember and recognize that Jesus focuses on the suffering of the man, and that should be our focus as we're seeking to, to serve him. I like this quote from Tim Keller as he provides some insights into this. Even though Jesus agrees that sin in general causes suffering in general, right? The, the reason that we have issues and brokenness in the world is because of what? Sin. sin. Every malady, every experience we can think about is a result of sin. However, he says Jesus essentially denies the idea that individual suffering is necessarily or always caused by individual sin. That your individual suffering necessarily comes from individual sin. Just like God rejects it at the end of the book of Job, Jesus rejects it here. Amen. Sometimes that may be the case, but it's not always the case, is it? It's not necessary to say that individual sin is always the cause of individual suffering. Yes, it's true in the general sense, but it's not always the case in the individual sense. And I think if we're looking at suffering here, we all face suffering in our lives, and we can respond in a couple of ways to suffering. We can either say, God, I hate thee, and we begin to hate God for what's happening and the reason why, or some people think the suffering's their fault, and it goes from I hate thee to I hate me. And say, God, there's something intrinsically wrong with me. Yes, we're all broken, but like was shared, this man would have thought that God had totally rejected him, and the reason he was born blind was because of who he was. And so we can respond to suffering in two ways. And uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 17 to 18, Jesus is really good focusing on this idea of spiritual blindness. And in fact, we'll find out later that it's harder to fix spiritual blindness versus physical blindness. That's the harder healing. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 18, it says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk 
in the futility of their mind, having their understanding, what, darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their what? Heart. So the Bible says we can be spiritually blind. We can walk in darkness spiritually, even though we can see physically. Just as physical blindness prevents us from seeing the world around us, spiritual blindness prevents us from understanding and experiencing God's truth. There is a blindness there that goes beyond the physical. Also, it's brought up in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, whose minds, the God of this age, who is that? Satan has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. The God of this age, Satan, Satan's principal work is to blind the hearts and the minds of people. He does this by keeping them from the study of God's word. He does this by, you know, different philosophies, relativism, we think about secularism, atheism, there's many different ways that God, uh, that Satan tries to blind us to God's truth and his light, and he can distract us in many ways. Just a uh, hand over here. Well, the spiritual blindness is what got Christ crucified. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were willfully blind and were not willing to see. And so that's, again, caused him to be crucified. Right, right. And it was by a group of people that thought they could see. And that's maybe the most dangerous thing. When you think you can see, but you're really blind, and yet this man recognized he was blind, it allowed him to see. Yeah. Okay. So we'll... So there's, you know, does anyone want to mention any ways that maybe today we can be maybe experiencing blindness as, a, as, as the world around us is in need of God's spiritual light in us? How does that take place today? A couple of things that you've said to me are relevant with current popular culture. Uh, what you just said about it's much easier to heal spiritual uh, physical blindness and spiritual blindness at first blush that doesn't seem ridiculous but it really is not because God can do anything he created everything he can fix anything but one thing he won't do and can do is coerce our minds so the spiritual blindness you're describing is it, 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 it classic <clears throat> or to, to, relevant to today and to quote heathen cultures unquote from that time where they pursue their own ends, and we all know where pursuing human selfishness leads. All we have to do is look at world history, and the person that, the people that lead and rule, the ones with the best weapons, uh, most effectively deployed against the other people who are at their mercy. Um, in Christ's world, um, if you look at pop culture today, things are happening now that you wouldn't believe possible just 10 or 15 years ago absolutely would have never ever conceived possible and um and, and one of uh, god's i think his pet peeve sins i think jesus hated pride more than just about anything it deprived him of his best friend uh, lucifer uh, because lucifer couldn't fight that that pride and and, and, and recant when he realized that he was at fault and likewise today, uh, if you look at what's happening with children in our culture, it's, it's just impossible to believe. And that also, I believe, is one of God's pet peeves. Since he says there are special consequences and penalties for people who take advantage of children. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happening in our, in our world today. And it's not physical. Uh, well, it can become physical, but it's spiritual to begin with. And that's the spiritual rot and cancer that has somehow taken place in our society today, particularly our country. Yeah. Yeah, we can be a source of that. Over here, Bob. Ever since you read that last verse, I just the futility of their mind. Mm -hmm. That's where we get into trouble. The futility of our minds. That's how Satan got in trouble. 
he started thinking too much away from God, the futility of our minds. I just couldn't get that out of my head since you read it. Yeah, they thought, and that, that comes up later. They said, we know this man's a sinner. You know, the Pharisees are always saying what they know, and the man is saying, I don't know if he is or not. I don't know, you know, he's recognizing his humbleness, and yet the Pharisees believe that they know it all, and that causes them to even be more blind. So Jesus responds here and says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am, there's the declaration, the light of the world. So the disciples are asking a very binary question, right? Is it this or this? And it reminds me of Joshua. He's going into Canaan. He sees that angelic being and he says, are you on our side or their side? Right? And what does he say? Neither. The question is, are you on my side? Right? We can, in so much ways in our humanity, keep things so binary. And Jesus says, neither his parents or he sinned, but the works of God could be revealed. Any thoughts or reflections there on that verse? Even though I've read this before, it didn't really hit me until now. Um, what's that message for each of us? But that the works of God shall be revealed in me. And so we live in a, in a broken world, a moaning, groaning world. Each of us is afflicted. And that's the fact. But we can choose to say, Lord, use me live through me so that I may do your works so that whatever I do I can do to the praise of your glory so it really doesn't matter what the ailment is if it's blindness or dropsy or whatever it is um, we have a chance we have the choice that we can say Lord you can use this brokenness to show God I mean, that's a phenomenal thing that's a beautiful thing reminds me of the story of Joseph that was sent to Egypt. He said, God sent me. But was it God's will that he be betrayed by his brothers to be, uh, you know, in jail all those years unfairly? But he said this, that, that essentially what you meant for evil, God turned to good in Exodus 50, uh, Genesis 50 verse 20. So God can even take the broken things of the world and turn them into his glory and bring him glory through that brokenness. It says all things work together for good, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say all things are good. There's a difference. Not all things are good, but even when they're not good, God can work it around for good uh, through his grace and his mercy there. Yeah, over here. As you were talking about the binary uh, perspective that we have to have, I did think about the subject of light and darkness and how it plays out uh, to some degree in what we're reading about here because of their question. But I would just only like to offer this thought, and I think we've talked about it before, but the light of God's love his wisdom, knowledge, everything about God shines into the darkness. And this, I don't think it needs to be said, but I want to say it anyway, that there is no darkness in this world that the light of God can't shine into. Jesus is willing to dive into however you want to describe it, die, jump into, swim into, immerse himself into the darkest place mm -hmm. in people's lives, in my life, in anybody's life. And he's not afraid to do that like we are. I love that illustration because he's diving into the darkest 
moment which this man was born blind and he brings light to a very dark situation. Yeah. Now, we did read earlier where in John chapter one, I believe it is, he said, came to his own and in another place, and they received him not. And then another place it says that they chose darkness over the light. Mm -hmm. And like Rob said, he doesn't force his way. He won't force his will. He won't command us to serve him. Right. It's always an invitation to be part of his life. Yeah. That's great. The question is, do we want to remain in the darkness or walk towards the light? When it comes to this theological debate, uh, this is what Ellen Weiss says. The disciples were not called upon to discuss the question as to who had sinned or who had not sinned, but to understand the mercy, the power and mercy of God in giving sight to the blind. That was the purpose of this miracle, Ellen White says. Instead of debating the cause of suffering, we should focus on alleviating suffering. Okay? Uh, for instance, this can happen in our congregations, right? Someone falls ill. Instead of discussing, you know, we can say, why did they fall ill? And, you know, discussing, you know, are they having this diet or this diet? There may be some... You know, there may be, it's this value in having a healthy lifestyle, but the focus should be on providing support and prayer as well for their recovery. Okay? Uh, instead of debating the, necessarily the cause of suffering. That was not the reason why Jesus was going to do this miracle. It was primarily to show them the mercy and power of God in giving sight to this blind man. So, in Jesus is now going to provide healing in verse 6 and 7. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And so here we have an explanation of what the Paul uh, is translated to sent. Most likely John's writing to a, also a Gentile audience that need a little bit of interpretation here. And he commanded him to wash in the pool. Tell me, what, is, what are some uh, spiritual lessons we can draw out of this? The significance of the pool and the significance of Jesus spitting on the ground to make clay there out of that. Um, and put it on his eyes. This story really comes alive when you're in Jerusalem and when you actually see um, possibly where Jesus was, where the blind man was. The text doesn't really tell us where specifically this happened. Yeah. But we know where the Pool of Siloam is. Right. And only recently, in the last uh, couple of years, has the Pool of Siloam actually been found. And excavated. And this last year, they were excavating the extent of it, trying to find the full extent of the pool because the Greek Orthodox Church owned that property and they didn't have permission to go in. And anyway, they worked all that out. They also have excavated the whole um, staircase system that went from the temple all the way down to the Pool of Siloam. And it's a it's a downhill walk. To, oh, you have all that. Sorry, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Oh wow, I feel yeah. like a good student. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. So anyway, those steps. I mean, there's 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 several hundred steps, most likely, um, where you and they've just been excavating it just in the last completing that excavation in the last year or so, and it's just really powerful to think that this blind man had to have a lot of faith to do what Jesus asked him to do. I mean, he was blind, he had steps to walk, it was, was not close. We like to take a bus and walk back from the Pool of Siloam back up to where we started in this height when we do the Hezekiah's Tunnel or whatever. Um, and, and this man walked it blind. That also implies that maybe he had to have some help. Maybe he had to have somebody lead him there. So that's, that's another aspect as we think about what Jesus is trying to do. There's, 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 there's people involved in that, and there's people helping that. Man, I think about the, the Capernaum miracle where the four friends took this right. paralytic and lowered him through the roof. Um, so anyway, there's just there's some really neat insights yeah. into that too. Yeah, the power of community in the healing. Um, as there's a hand over here, but as we're headed there, this is where the pool of Siloam would have been um, in the city there. 
And the Pool of Bethesda is in the north, I want to say, and the Pool of Siloam is in the south. So um, that's where we're being located. One thing that comes to my mind um, when it talks about Jesus stooping down and grabbing some clay or some dirt, mm -hmm. I think of Genesis 2 when there's a further description of creating, creating man, forming us yeah. out of his hands. And it, it's a reminder to us that something went wrong with our first birth, all of us here. It, uh, we need the second birth. And so in a way, that's what he's doing with this man. He's, he's reforming him. And he's involving him in this process, which is just incredibly beautiful. And you see in other of his miracles where you are part of that. Um, get up, take up your bed, and walk. You know, um, to, to Peter, throw the net on the other side. And at your word, I will do it. So it also emphasizes the power of the word of God and us believing his word and, and living out that word and doing what he says. There's so much in here, but it, it does make me think of creation. Yeah, the first time that God works with dust is in the creation account. So God not only has the power to create, but also to recreate us, which is a, a, a wonderful thing. Yes, over here. Um, I'm not sure if I'm making too much of a leap with this, but it's interesting that it says in parentheses, which is interpreted sent. Yes. In that text. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, and for me, where my mind goes is sometimes we wait until we're perfectly healed. So we, we want to see everything clearly before we go and do what God has asked us. And I love that he went blind, mm -hmm. that he was, he went on the mission God gave him while I sit waiting for perfection, knowing that the last thing that Jesus said before he left this earth was go and tell everybody. Yeah. It was an act of faith, wasn't it? Sometimes we have to go blind like Abraham. Go, I don't know where, but you know. <laughs> You're going, and you you think the man might have been thinking inwardly, uh, Jesus, why don't you just help me here? I know that you have the power to do it. Why are you sending me? And like Michael was pointing out, this is quite a journey to undertake while blind. Right. He would certainly have had a very difficult time doing it himself. And then I think the powerful spiritual lesson that we recognize, we start out this chapter recognizing this man is in great need. But obviously, we're going to end up recognizing there are people in greater need. There's something that's worse, worse than physical blindness. Right. And so that's what the chapter is driving us to. Yeah. And so, yeah, this man was uh, healed through um, Jesus putting clay on his eyes. Obviously, that would have been an irritant, right? He would have had to wash his face. And in some ways, the word of God becomes an irritant to us in some ways where it causes us to look at our own lives and say, God, I need to be cleansed by you. The word that is revealing my brokenness and I need to be cleansed, then we get cleansed by the, the, the spring of life, by the water of life, Jesus. And so he goes for that cleansing and then he can see in some ways, I'm not going to put that connection too, too strongly, but in some ways for me, it represents baptism, that the word of God speaks to us and we realize our need of cleansing and we're sent to the pool for that cleansing. Um, so we'll just uh, go along here where in verse 18, I've missed a few verses here just to get to the end of the story. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. Okay, so the Jewish leaders don't believe that this is the case until they call the parents of him who had received sight his sight. Just know that there's no um, story up until this point in the Bible of someone being blind at birth and now can see. This is the first instance this is happening. And they ask them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. Um, Pharisees are finding it very difficult, but by what means he now sees, we do not know. 
or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, he will speak for himself. Okay, so there's some fear and trepidation here from the Jewish leaders. Uh, LMI says this, there was, uh, there was the man himself declaring that he would, had been blind and he had his sight restored, but the Pharisees would rather, this is so powerful, deny the evidence of their own senses than admit that they were in error. So powerful is prejudice, so distorting is pharisaical righteousness. Why couldn't they see? Why couldn't they recognize that Jesus has healed this man? Two reasons, prejudice and pharisaical righteousness. What are, you, what are your thoughts regarding that, these two things? And is it possible that we can judge things from external appearances as well? rather than allowing God to, to help us see a deeper lesson there. One other thing, a little earlier in the story, <laughs> remember the man had been blind but not deaf, and they're discussing him in <laughs> his presence yeah, as yeah. if he couldn't hear, and they're saying, was he one? Well, he looks like him, maybe it's not him, and finally he says, I, I am the one. Yeah. I, I am the one who was blind. Yeah, just going back to you to the first and second verses today. Um, when they came upon this man, it's obvious from the, what it says in those verses that everybody there knew this beggar. They knew that he'd been blind from birth. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a mystery. They all knew it, which tells me that the Pharisees and the scribes and everybody that was there also knew it. They knew this guy, and yet even knowing, you know. He was blind from birth. We know this. We, um, like you said, they were so into themselves mm -hmm. that you know they started questioning. Yeah. And a, another point I wanted to make, going prior to you know putting the mud in, I didn't want to call Greg because I don't want to wear him out. He's way back up in the corner. But one of the things that that immediately struck me is you know um, Jesus is also the potter. And he works with clay and he right. changes us. Mm -hmm. And so for him to take that clay, I mean, I'm saying, I just think that's a beautiful picture of him saying, I'm the potter. I am changing your life. I'm going to remove this cancer of sin from you, mm -hmm. along with your blindness. Yeah. And, and I mean, that, to me, that's just sweet. Yeah. God can mold us and reshape us through his grace. Jim, over here. Just going to uh, mention that uh, we talked about an event where he was born blind, or now he sees as a single event. But I see it more that maybe we try to mix what we have life of God's love, and then we try to look at this darkness we like to have with the other things too. So maybe the washing of the stuff off his face was to give him a lesson that that's an ongoing process. We, we take a bath every day, right? We cleanse, we need cleansing more than just the one time. It's so true, and, and that comes up that there's a continual revelation of who Jesus is to this man um, that we'll see. Yeah. I think it's very interesting that the Lord uses other people to help us. Yeah. I think of Helen Keller. I think most of you know that she, at a young age, was very seriously ill. And when she came out of the illness, she couldn't see or hear. But the Lord sent her at a very young age a teacher who changed her life. Yes. And she grew up to be very intelligent and as the president of the United States. But without that teacher, she would have been lost. Right. Yes, the power of community. As I think about this, there was a lot of time that elapsed from when he was identified, when Jesus saw him, and then how long the Pharisees prolonged this. I mean, everything they did was by foot. Well, go get his parents. Well, that may have taken an hour. Who knows? By the time he'd gone to the pool, well, this could have been an all-day experience here. And then the Pharisees go, yeah, I don't know. They deny their own senses. And prolong this whole thing. It was to me quite curious how their spiritual blindness complicated matters. 
beyond what was necessary. Yeah. We've got one over there, and as we're heading there um, at the back, uh, we know uh, prejudice, prejudice and pharisaical righteousness. The man born blind repeatedly admits, I don't know. Where's Jesus? I don't know. He is a sinner. I don't know. Who is the son of man? I don't know. And yet the Pharisees insist they can see and they know. We know this man is a sinner referring to Jesus. And we know God spoke to Moses. And so there's a, you know, there's a contrast here between what the Pharisees believe they know versus this humble posture of this man. Okay. So question. Was this man broken? Yes. Could he fix his problem? No. Was it easy for Jesus to fix his problem? Yes. Simple. Let me read this. This is Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace, and I put in parentheses, grace is God's wonderful generosity that you have been saved. Just like this man, Jesus heals us. And not just for a short time. We're going to live forever because of what he did. And that healing was intended to be a testimony for those around him to the glory of God. And yet they cannot see it. Um, I love the title of this book, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. <laughs> And it talks about the cognitive dissonance. Um, cognitive dissonance is what we feel when the self-concept, I'm smart, I'm kind, I'm convinced, this belief is true, is threatened by evidence. That's what we have here. We have evidence of what Jesus did, evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, that we, do, that we did something that wasn't smart and we did something that hurt another person, that the belief isn't. True. So if we have cognitive dissonance, if we have to choose between something being true or whether I'm in the fault, we'll change what we believe is true to make it fit our circumstance. And that's what's happening here. They're saying that this man can't be from God. He, one of the reasons they say is because he did the healing on Sabbath, right? So he cannot be from God. So in John chapter 9, verse 24 and 25, so they again called the man who was blind, and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. And I love this. This is a testimony to skeptics. Very simple. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Though, that, it's just the evidence. Though I was blind, now I see. And I I kind of summarize this if you're going to give your testimony to skeptics, because sometimes it's not about the evidence. Sometimes it is, but no matter how much evidence you share, it's not enough. This is what he simply said. He kept it simple and honest. He just said, this is my testimony, very straightforward. He focused on personal experience and not arguments. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to tell you plainly that I was blind and now I see. He acknowledged what he didn't know. Sometimes you're going to say, I don't know. I don't know all the science and the physics. I don't know all the philosophical arguments. One thing I know, my experience. I was addicted to this and God saved me. I was a compulsive whatever and God led me out of this. I was a broken sinner, but God restored me and took away my shame. That's one thing I know. Okay, and then he points to Jesus as the source of his healing. The way it happened was Jesus Christ saved. Amen. Just four simple things when we're giving our testimony to skeptics. Now, did they believe after it? Oh. No. The point of the miracle isn't always to convince others. All that God asks us to do is to be faithful with our testimony. Amen. Just share your testimony. It's, it's, it's not up to you whether they believe or not. It's up to them how they respond to your testimony. All we're called to do is share the story. Uh, hand over here. Yeah. 
Yes, according to the uh, brother here talking about the cancer of sin um, and the leprosy of it, how it destroys us. Uh, we look at sin and, and we talk about sin all the time. And this really puzzled me through the years. And looking at John again, he says, along with sin is the breaking of the law. Well, and it's like, oh, God said, hey, look at this again, along with. So I said, God, what's, what is sin? And, and he didn't clear it up to me then, but he cleared it up to me in 16, John 16, 7, 8, and 9. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove or convict the world of sin and of righteousness of judgment. Wow. Oh, sin, because they did not believe in me or on me. On is synonymous with it, within. They chose to use on in the King James, but a lot of them have in Christ. And you look all through the Old Testament, it's, it's in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. But we don't understand the in that God as Paul brings out in 1 Corinthians 1.30, that God placed us in Christ, and Christ became our high priest or our representative or became us. That's what it says in Hebrews 7, 20, 32 or 26, that he became us, you and me. So when he died, you and I died and paid the law. The law will not let us all of this earth without paying him. And when he has paid, he says, okay, you're free. Amen. He paid it all. Amen. And with a few moments we have left, there's a few hands up here. Um, he was cast out, right? Uh, he was cast out by the authorities. The wonderful thing is Jesus finds him. I love that. He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? After Jesus found him and Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Here quickly we see a progression of this man. First he called Jesus a man, then he called him a prophet, then he said he's from God. Ultimately, through worship, he says he's the Messiah. Amen. By worshipping God, we get a greater revelation of God as we come together and worship him. Um, we'll conclude uh, with this statement, then just a final illustration here. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, last night, my husband and I listened to a message that was shared with us by a friend about the Seventh-day Adventist guys. I think they're involved with Adventist World Radio going into the very front lines of the battle of you, between Ukraine and Russia and literally banging on the tops of tanks and giving them Bibles, incredible miracles. Like they ran out of Bibles and then they go to the back of the truck and there's a whole new box. They they keep pulling Bibles out of their pocket. It's the most incredible story you can imagine, but the sense of urgency they have to share this message with these guys who are dying who is very likely that day may be their last day, and they're willing to die to carry this message. I will never be the same. Kenny and I just kind of sat there speechless for a while. But something came home to me that is a hot topic right now, and something that I struggle with as a nurse, having the right attitude, and I see it in new light this morning after hearing that message. And that is the incredible cancer we have of such of homosexuality, of, of, of just this divergent sexuality that is so different from what, from God's plan. And yet these are my patients. These are the people that I am called to love and embrace and show the love of God without gathering my pharisaical robes around me. They were judging a man who they had no idea what he was. He was a sinner, but, you know, they didn't know his sin. 
we might be able to identify the sin? Does that change how we react? And I just want to ask these people, are they still alive? They are. And there's still time. Right. There's still hope. Yes. The devil is killing them in droves by suicide. There's still time. There's still hope. I don't know how to reach them. But I want to ask you guys to join me in praying that he guides us how to reach them before the pendulum swings back and it becomes the law of the land to push that back because it's always the way to do it in love, not force. Not and yeah. I just ask everyone to pray with me because I don't know how to do it, but I do believe they're still alive. There's still hope. There's still hope. So we'll finish with this statement from Ellen White because I think it speaks to your point. She says this, to all who what? Realize. Who realize their need. Anyone, no matter their circumstance, Christ came with infinite help. Amen. When we recognize our need, Christ comes with infinite help. There is infinite help available. I know we, we probably have uh, got to close up here. All right, one more comment. Okay, real quick. I saw someone that could see that became blind. He was a minister, higher criticism. He stopped reading the word and stopped praying. And literally before my eyes, he became theologically blind. Blind. It's dangerous when you stop reading God's word. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, right? A light to my path. And so with that, we'll have a word of prayer. We want to pray for those. And we want to pray as we realize our need, God comes with infinite help right beside us. Let us pray. Lord, we're just so grateful once again that you are the light of the world. Lord, sometimes we feel like that blind man. But Lord, if we're really honest with our souls, sometimes we're the Pharisees as well. And we recognize that we are either vacillating between one or the other, seeing our need, but sometimes we don't see our need. Lord, we want to realize our need this morning, whether it's within our families, whether it's within a workplace and things seem helpless, whether it's in our finances, whether it's in those that we're praying for, even within our families or our neighbors, uh, whether it's our campus, dear Lord, in the classroom, young people wanting to come to have a closer relationship with you. Sometimes situations can seem helpless. We realize we're living in the last days. But Lord, when we realize our need, infinite help comes. Lord, we pray that your light will give us eyes to see this morning. May you put your eye salve on our eyes, dear Lord, so we can see our condition, not to, not to lead to help hopelessness, but to lead to the one that can cleanse us, to lead to the power that can transform us through your grace. We thank you for that free gift, and we pray that you bless us with eyes to see. For we, can, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.